My father worked for almost 50 years as a life insurance salesman, not because he liked it, because he didn't. He did it because he had three kids that he wanted to see grow up in a neighborhood that was safe and secure. A safe home surrounded by a community of neighbors who cared for each other. Band-Aids for skinned knees, July 4th parties, block parties that went on for hours, crocheted baby blankets when a new child was born, casseroles when we'd lost a loved one. He worked hard day and night to provide those things for the people that he loved. Larry English was a contractor in Douglas, Georgia, who worked hard every day to provide for his wife and two children, and to save for his dream to live on the water in a neighborhood just like that, safe, secure, filled with people who would care for each other. And when he became ill, he and his wife, Amy, had to fast forward their dreams. They fast forwarded that retirement dream, bought that land, and began working on their dream home, the project of building that home in Satilla Shores. It's the sort of life we all have the right to seek the safety and security and comfort of people that we care about and who care about us. We work hard for our stuff. It's ours, and no one has the right to take it. And we should never, ever have to fear intruders. The police can be counted on to help, to respond but they can't be everywhere and they can't be everything. A good neighborhood is always policing itself. Ugh. Mr. Moore, you really need to put a fence around that swimming pool. I'm worried a child will fall in. Mrs. Pennock, <laughs> Bobby is flying down Crossbrook Drive again in that new car. You have to talk with him and get him to slow down so no one is hurt. The police can't be everywhere, and in a safe, secure neighborhood, police are helped by those neighbors. Officer Rash testified, neighbors help neighbors, and neighbors help the police. There are really only two questions for you to answer, to reach your verdict in the charges that the state has brought against Greg McMichael. Did Greg McMichael have reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion to believe that Ahmad Arbery had committed a burglary at 220 Satilla Drive? And did he have reasonable and probable grounds to believe that Ahmad Arbery was escaping or attempting to escape yet again on February 23rd? It is a nine count indictment. Nine counts. So why only two questions? Well, I want to suggest to you what the state suggested, but in reverse. I'd like to suggest a methodical, efficient way to think about all this law and all these charges. I suggest that you begin at the beginning. Count one, malice murder. 
and then take all the rest of those counts, two through nine, as one big chunk as you consider these important questions. Even count one, that malice murder count, is defended by the answers to those questions. But with malice murder, I suggest to you, you don't even have to get to those questions. Greg McMichael pulled no trigger. How could the state seek a conviction for malice murder as Greg stood in the bed of the pickup truck on the phone with 911 as the fatal shots were fired as a party to the crime? Ms. Dunikoski told you about the law that the judge will give you. If someone intentionally helps or aids or procures or hires or assists in the commission of a crime, they can be as guilty as the principal, as the person who fired the shots. But what is so very different about count one is that it's malice murder. It requires the desire and the intent to kill, the deliberate intention to take the life of another human being. Where all of the circumstances of the killing, show that an individual acted with an abandoned and malignant heart. The state will have to be asking you to find that Greg McMichael advised or encouraged <clears throat> Travis McMichael, his son, to take the life of Ahmaud Arbery because that's what he wanted to do. For no reason other than to see that young man die. And to see him die at the hands of his own son and to do it right there in front of his eyes. Because the guy keeps breaking down and breaking into that house down the street. That's the level of criminal intent, the level of depravity, heartlessness, sickness that you would need to find beyond a reasonable doubt to find Greg McMichael guilty of malice murder. That's why I suggest that you begin with count one and quickly dispatch of it with a not guilty verdict. And then move down to the remaining counts, counts two through nine, because it comes down to this. If Greg McMichael was authorized by law to attempt to execute a citizen's arrest, to try to detain Ahmad Arbery for the police to come and do their job, to try to keep peace and safety within that neighborhood, then they were within the law to hold him there for the police. How else does one hold an individual who does not want to be arrested for the police? You have to contain him, not false imprison him, contain him. You have to possibly hold him at gunpoint without firing a shot, not an aggravated assault, but the use of a reasonable and measured amount of force to make him stay where he did not want to stay. So if they were acting within the law, in trying to execute a citizen's arrest, to detain Ahmaud Arbery for the police, then Travis had every single right to defend himself when Ahmaud Arbery inexplicably took that sharp left turn at the right front of the truck, seeking to disarm Travis McMichael. So, Who's got to prove what? We begin as we always begin in a courtroom.